When I watched the untold story of Petrarch for the first time, I felt like something was off. And after rewatching it a few times and going over some of the details, and even comparing it to Kieran's grandpa's version of the story that we get in-game, I came to a very simple conclusion. The untold story of Petrarch is a lie. In the same way that the Kitakami villagers version of the story was also a lie. But before I present my reasoning and evidence, I think it's fair to look through this whole animation and see what new plot details actually do get revealed. Because if Petron's version of events is the true version of the story, then that significantly changes the context of everything we experience in Kitakami. And I'm not just talking about like on an emotional level, but like it actually creates some pretty significant plot holes. So here we go. So we're told that Petron originally belonged to a loving old couple from an unnamed faraway land. We are not told how or when they found Petrant, but it couldn't have been long because very quickly they get addicted to eating its mochi, Petrant becomes addicted to their affection and seeks to please them with more and more favors, and now the couple getting more and more greedy under the influence of this mochi, finally asks Petrant to go on a great quest to a faraway land to fetch some brilliant masks that they heard rumors about. And of course Petrant agrees, and during his travels he recruits the loyal three for this journey to keep Kitakami. And let's pause here because this journey is made out to look like some kind of band of brothers, you know, friends going on a big adventure. But in reality, Petron did not recruit the Loyal Three. He is mind controlling them. He feeds them all mochi to do this with him. Like this is just essentially establishing how the Loyal Three got their toxic chains and share the poison typing. And can we also just acknowledge how strange of a request this is coming from the old couple? Like they never explain why they want the masks. And even the narrator points out that this is kind of weird. The only old couple requested something peculiar. Like, is this actually a desire that they have, or is this just Petrant speaking through them to itself, considering they are kind of under his control at this point, right? We're also led to believe that Petrant tames Okidogi after being sent on this quest, like as a traveling buddy, but you can clearly see Okidogi's tail in this earlier shot while he was still running those smaller errands uh, for the couple. And maybe this is nothing, maybe we're supposed to assume that they were friends before the journey even started, but it could also mean we're dealing with an unreliable narrator who is leaving information out of the story. But going back to where we left off, the Loyal Three and Petrant arrive at Kitakami, and everything from this point on seems to line up pretty well with the events that we're already aware of in the base game. With the Loyal Three discovering the cave where the masks are located, they end up fighting Ogre Pond's human companion as he tries to defend the masks, but he can only protect one, and they get away with the other three. And this is where there's a really small and subtle difference between the story that we get in the game versus Petron's side of the story. Because in the game, the Loyal Three retreat to the village with the three masks, and Ogre Pond finds them there and defeats them in front of the villagers who have no idea what's happening. They're just scared of this raging ogre and assume that the Loyal Three were fighting to protect the village, which leads to them being in as heroes. So in other words, the location of this fight between Ogrepan and the Loyal Three and the fact that it is witnessed by villagers is vital to the plot of the Teal Mask DLC. So with that in mind, how is it that in this animation, this fight is clearly happening far away from the village? Like you can see the lights of the village far in the distance of this shot. And then in other shots, it's very clear that they're in like a big open field or just out in the wilderness somewhere. So if this is the true version of events, then who witnessed this fight? How did the entire legend of the Loyal Three get started, like if nobody saw Ogre Pond raging? So either Kieran's grandpa is wrong about his version of events, or this story is a lie. And that is essentially the end of the story. Ogre Pond just one-shots Petcheron, and then it just lays dormant somewhere in the woods until I guess it finds its way to Peachy's shop in Kitakami. Uh, and I gotta admit, even with my own suspicions put aside, like this is a very compelling case made for Petron as maybe not an actual malicious evil Pokemon, but more of a victim of its own power. And it makes him out to be a surprisingly sympathetic character in a very effective way, which I don't think anybody saw coming because everything about Petron just made it seem like a very generic evil Pokemon just based on its stats and movesets and the role that it plays in the epilogue. And honestly, whether the story is true or not, this is just a very cool way to handle a mythical Pokemon release. And I'm not debating like the big 
big picture reveals like of course Petrant is connected to like the poison typing of the loyal three and is responsible for the toxic chains and all that but even if we set aside all the conflicts between both sides of the story and if we take away the ability to compare this to the Momotaro Japanese folklore which is like a very obvious one-to-one -one connection remove all that and there are still just so many unanswered questions in this plot like neither side of the story gives us any confirmation about who was Ogre Pond's human companion. Like, I think we're supposed to assume that he perished while protecting the Teal Mask, but they don't explicitly say that he did, and I don't know if that's intentional or if that's just Game Freak trying to keep things, like, very PG-friendly. I've also never seen anybody question why the Mask Maker decided to give Ogre Pond and the human four masks if they really only needed two to accomplish their goal of, like, just blending in. And then there's the signboard of the Loyal Three with some mysterious other figure, which an NPC literally calls the Loyal Three's trainer. Uh, like, who is that? Or is this just like a human representation for Petra Run? Is he throwing a Pokeball or is he throwing Mochi? And I know this is kind of a problem with the anime too, but like, how did Ogre Pond win in a 4v1 scenario when Petrant and the Loyal Three had a clear type advantage? We're talking poison versus grass, like Ogre Pond should not have stood a chance. Honestly, most of the stuff related to Petrant is just very suspicious to me. Like the fact that you start the epilogue with just some random mystical Petra Berry that just gets downloaded from the internet. Like I can't be the only person that completely missed that they made a whole like fake social media ad for this berry as if it was an actual product. A special gift for any occasion. A thank you or congratulations. And even in that ad, it ends with like static and kind of a questionable like purple haze. Coming via mystery gift, whether you like it or not. Like, I have to wonder, is that just a design choice, or is the implication that maybe Petrant, the puppeteer Pokemon, mind you, might be actually controlling part of this narrative as well on social media, the way that the epilogue plays out? Because so much of it is just so goofy in-game, like, it feels like it's winking at you. The fact that Kieran gets, like, hit in the head with Emochi instead of getting possessed. Like, to me, that feels like a very deliberate poke at all the fans that had those theories about his, like, purple hand aura. And I'll say it, I liked the chicken dance. I wish we got all the characters doing the chicken dance. I was disappointed that they just didn't go harder with that. Um, and it's actually a pretty big inconsistency with Petrant's story and the fact that the old couple that he cares about so much that he fully possessed, like, you see the purple eyes and everything? No chicken dance, huh? What's up with that? And I know there are rumors about maybe more DLC coming to the game. And to be honest, they did leave so much vague, even by the end of this epilogue, that like, they could explore some of these questions, but... I think the more likely option is that Game Freak is leaving those details ambiguous intentionally. And maybe this is giving them too much credit if it's not intentional, but having two dueling stories like this is actually a perfect representation of what really happens with myths and legends as they get passed on from generation to generation. Like sure the main plot points might survive that process, but inevitably the smaller details and character motivations are going to change based on who's telling the story or maybe what makes for a more entertaining story. And at that point, after enough time has passed, it really just falls to the audience to gut check what they think is the truer version of events. And here we have Nintendo and the Pokemon Company on social media very intentionally framing these posts about the epilogue and the animation using phrases like what could be the true tale of this Pokemon, or referencing Petra Run's story as just a theory. So yeah, with that as evidence, I think they have no intention of actually revealing these answers. I think the whole point is that you don't know for sure. And it actually makes perfect sense that we get Petra Run's story last, because Petra Run was clearly on the losing side of history. Even at the start of the animation, the narrator clearly says, The tale you are about to hear has never been told in the land of Kitakami. And yeah, why would it be? Like, we play the entire game from the perspective of the Kitakami people. Like, who would we have encountered within that storyline that would have been aware of Petrant's details in history without Game Freak doing exactly what it did and just acting as the DM and introducing new information from outside the game? Because if we didn't have the untold story, what do we have in game? We have Petrant reacting to Ogre Pond and the Loyal Three in that battle that you have with it, which definitely hints at some kind of angst between them, but again, we 
wouldn't know exactly what. And then there's the smaller detail that when caught, Petrant can only have a timid nature, which definitely wouldn't line up with your typical expectation, again, of an evil Pokemon. And this might actually be the strongest piece of evidence for that version of Petrant we see in the untold story being true, that maybe it really did have good intentions and it was just a victim of its own power. But here's an interesting question. Would knowing the truth about Petrant's motivations change how we completed the story? Does Petrant not being evil make it any less of a danger to itself and others? Like, these are surprisingly complex moral dilemmas to be presenting in a Pokemon DLC. And I'll be honest, I was I was kind of bored through most of Kitakami. I really like the Indigo disc, and I'm gonna be talking more about that in future videos. But this five minute animation alone has single-handedly given me so much more respect for the Teal Mask DLC and its story. And my first reaction to seeing it was like, oh my God, why couldn't this have just been in the game itself? But I am aware that this is pretty normal for mythicals. Usually they just get their backstory through like a movie or something. They're usually not part of the game. But I think in this case, it actually worked out in their favor. And I might be giving them too much credit, maybe they're not thinking this meta, but like, if the goal was to not just make a, yeah, here's the final piece of the lore puzzle, but also something that you really have to question if it's valid or not, then releasing this as an internet video actually makes a lot of sense because internet videos, as we know, are not fully trustworthy. Not in the same way that if they had made like a full movie, I don't think there would be as much debate over whether like it's canon or not. Because remember, Petron is a puppet master with the ability to control people. Like, I don't think it's a crazy statement to say this whole ad campaign might just be a last ditch effort for it to gain sympathy from people. And honestly, what better way to do that than manipulating people on the internet with a sob story? And I'm not even saying I believe that fully, but if that was part of the design process and part of why they did things the way they did, that's pretty cool. Quick update, look what Pokemon just put on their Twitter the day after this short went up. Like, is that is that not evidence for, for what I'm saying here? Are they are they being controlled by Petrant? Anyway, that's it for my thoughts on the untold story of Petrant. Is it actually a lie? It very well could be. It's, it's a possibility. I mean, maybe I'm way off base if you disagree with any of these theories. I'd be very curious to hear other people's thoughts or maybe even get some counter evidence. I just had to share this somewhere. Um, I'm also gonna be making more videos about Scarlet and Violet, uh, specifically the Indigo disc in the future. So stay tuned for those and thanks for watching.